Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School with the Chesapeake, Western Branch, and Hampton Roads Seventh-day Adventist Churches. We are glad that you could join us this morning as we discuss the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology. So first we will get started with an opening prayer. We'll have Sister Teresa Taylor to open us with prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, as we begin our study in your word, as we've learned this week, which is our authority, Father, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit here with us. Lead us and guide us. And Father, help us to learn something that we didn't know before. Enlighten us, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for all of the families that are tuned in right now. I lift them up to you, Lord. I pray that you will bless them on this year Sabbath day. And Father, as we study, we thank you so much that we were able to get together on the Zoom so that we can still be in contact with each other. We praise you, Lord, and we glorify you on your Sabbath day. In Christ's dear name, we ask this in. Amen. 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 Thank you for that wonderful prayer, Sister Teresa. Uh, first, we'd like to get started with a couple of testimonies because we know that there's lots going on in the world today, which leaves lots of opportunity for God to bless us and to work through us in many different ways. Um, so we'll start with a testimony from Pastor Stoyan. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yes, I was, this week was such, such a blessing for me. I had several uh, Bible studies, but I want to share with you on the Bible study I had, I think it was on Monday in my day off. Uh, it was a beautiful testimony because the person that uh, joined me uh, and we were studying the Bible, she said that this is a wonderful, wonderful Bible study. And I was amazed to see how God has changed, how God has transformed, how God had has moved individuals. Right? right now, many people are starving for Jesus, for Jesus Christ. And we see uh, hundreds at this moment, uh, including in, in, the, in Hampton Road and many other parts that are coming to Jesus Christ. So I praise the Lord for this week and for his victory that he's giving us in our lives. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor Stoyan. And I think we also had another testimony from Sister Teresa Taylor she would like to share. I would just like to share what a blessing this lesson was for me personally this week. What I found out, the key point that, that I kind of took away from my study was the word of God doesn't change. No matter what is going on in the world and all the crazy things that are changing around us and swirling, you know, you can get caught up in that and, and you can get your attention off of God to all of these things happening in the world. But God wants us to stay focused on him. And I really found that blessing from this study because God's word is creative and um, he has the power to overcome anything. So my, my takeaway from the lesson, which is a testimony because it really calmed my spirit, was that God is the one that we can trust. He doesn't change. And his word is forever, and it is the authority that, that it is. And, and I'm just grateful that I was able to have that breakthrough this week spiritually. Amen. Amen. So as Sister Taylor says that, we're going to dive right into the lesson and get started this morning um, so we can kind of go through all the different pieces. There were different, a lot of different moving parts in this lesson, so it'll be good to see how this all works together. Uh, so we will start with our Sunday's lesson. If we can get someone to read Mark 7, verses 1 through 13, as we start to talk about tradition. It's Mark 7, chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. I can read it. Okay. Mark 7, verses 1 through 13. That's correct, then, yes. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat the bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. 
and there are many things which they have received in hope oh like of cups, copper vessels, and couches. When the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why did your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered to them and he said, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. The washing of pitchers and cups, many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect. Through your tradition, which you've handed down, such things you do. Thank you for reading that for us. Um, so as Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees in this passage, how, do, how does Jesus react to the traditions of his day? He wasn't very pleased with it. Um, he thought it was hindering the people. Um, he didn't have anything against them washing hands. It's, um, and the Pharisees, and I think the disciples themselves did wash their hands, but the ceremony that the Pharisees um, had implemented, they condemned the disciples for not upholding that. But Jesus wanted them to see, well, the reason why they had the washing of hands was because they, they came in contact with the Gentiles. And to them, being in contact with the Gentiles caused them to be defiled. Whereas God had set up Israel as a symbol of his people so that they can actually get in contact with the Gentiles. So they were going completely against what their, their mission was to get in contact with the dead Gentiles and teach them about Jesus. Instead, they, they thought the Gentiles made them defiled and they had a whole ceremony of cleaning themselves from contact with them in the marketplace. Um, so Jesus wanted them to see how blinded they were by not adhering to his commandments to love thy neighbor as thyself, to love God, they were actually showing distaste for their neighbor. So he wanted them to see how blind they were implementing these traditions of this washing and cleansing instead of doing the outreach he wanted them to do. Another thing that we have to take into consideration is that uh, it's not always a bad thing. Uh, the tradition has been played an important role in the, every culture. But the most important point is that when tradition is against God's Bible, uh, God's word, when individuals they are led by tradition instead of taking or leading by the word of God, that is an error. And practically, the tradition uh, of the Pharisees kept the nation to be united, kept the nation to be one, kept the nation to be um, uh, separated from the Gentiles. But the rigidity of all these tradition, all these laws, that they had to keep the law, made them to be such a way, in such a way to be diverted, to be directed to another way, which came, which was very dangerous. And practically they did not know the distinction between the tradition and the word of God. They knew that the word of God has the most important role in it is the only one, but because of traditions, they began to be equal, and today also plays an important role for many people. Let me say what I'm trying to say. 
for many denominations at this moment, tradition is old. We speak about Christian denominations like Catholic Church, Orthodox Churches, and many other denominations, which they put the tradition equals or above the Bible. So every time when we try to put the tradition above the Bible, we are failing. Seventh-day Adventists, we do have traditions. We have a lot of traditions, okay? We have the way we're doing service, the way we are, we are uh, doing the evangelists. We are, we are unique in the, in the message we are given. And the strategy we have has to be unique in a way. But right now, we, we have a different approaches. So what I'm trying to say, tradition is not bad. The tradition is very important in the culture, but the tradition should not be taking the place of the Bible. Crystal, I also believe that trying to follow the commandments of men turns your attention away from God and turns you to what's going on in the world instead of what, what, what's going on with God. Which is very true. And as we, Pastor was saying, you know, there's a lot of traditions that we take on culturally. There's some we take on in our churches. Um, he mentioned some of those. So if we were to invite someone into our church today, or when we can be in the church, um, how would you distinguish between what's tradition in the Seventh-day Adventist church and what the Bible says and how that kind of works together? That's a really good question. I've been contemplating that all week and I really am kind of fuzzy, which kind of tells me there's something there in that question about what is, you know, tradition and what is, um, you know, from the word of God in terms of the way we worship. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I guess we would, we would, that's why I think it's very important for us to be well acquainted with, 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 what, with what God's word is saying and the principles that we can extrapolate to our modern day. But like the pastor says, we don't want to, you know, make it so rigid that, you know, some, I remember, you know, I've been, I'm not going to name the church, but, you know, there's certain, you know, the order had, the church or service had to be a certain order, you know, three songs, four songs, and you have the prayer, and then it's like, well, I mean, that, that's a preference. That's what you like. But there's nothing that says that we couldn't do Sabbath school or do the sermon before Sabbath school, right? And then have worship service afterwards. There's nothing that says that we can't do it. Now, there may be people that want to stone me for suggesting that, but that that's where I would say that that's, a, that's just a tradition. You know, some churches, they feel that service has to go a certain way um, versus, you know, somebody like me that's like, well, as long as you have the main components, the order doesn't really matter, you know, but, you know, depending on where you come from and, and where you're used to, uh, the tradition uh, is there, you know, there are certain traditions about how we dress even when we come to church, you know, some people, you got to wear a suit and a tie, some people maybe not, you know, uh, now biblically, I mean, obviously they weren't wearing suit and ties in the Bible, so there's nothing that's divine ordinance that says we have to wear a suit and tie, that's what I say to come to church. Now, some people would say, I disagree, you know, that you need to dress your best and all this other stuff. Well, you know, just, that's tradition. You know, yeah. that's just, you just, I mean, the thing is, you know, there, there are, there's clearly biblical principles that you want to look clean and all these other things when you come to worship. But again, we don't want, uh, like, for instance, we don't want if somebody wants to come to church and they say, well, I don't have a suit and tie. I wouldn't say, well, I guess you got to get a suit and tie. And then you come to church next Sabbath. No, we don't want to say that, right? We would say, no, come with what you have, right? And then, you know, all these other things. So, yeah, there are certain things where I think that we have to be mindful that are we, are we elevating maybe even just a traditional preference versus uh, what's uh, thus saith the Lord, you know? The, strat or the, the way we are right now worshiping it uh, practically starting from, I would say, 16th, 17th century and the Puritan uh, church has developed this type of worship. And we can say that in that time, the type of worship was being reverent and had a very uh, a big impact. Uh, Christian tradition, practically, we are divided. When we speak about if we try to find a roots, we try to find um, the, the truth how they were worshiping, we don't have very clear um, the, the program of the first disciples. But we do know that we have several uh, elements in their, their worship. They were having songs, mm -hmm. 
God, they were having prayer, and they were sharing the scripture, and also they were having fellowship, potluck, every single Sabbath, but I would say every single day. Okay, they were having potluck every single day. Um, and they were having communion every single day. Uh, we have communion one out of three months. Uh, and why? This is a good reason because in the beginning we did the same thing as the, 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 uh, the pioneers, I would say the disciples they did, but we lost the importance, the, the meaning, the significance of the, the, the communion. It's, so we, do we have all of those elements in the Seventh-day Adventists? Yes, definitely. But the program is it's different because we don't know exactly how the program was in, in, the, in the, those times. But the tradition, in other words, Anglo-Saxon tradition, or has been, I would say the American tradition has been imposed in the sense of, um, has been shared with all the world because seven Adventists started from here. And so this is why we colonize, how do you call it? colonization. Um, yeah. When we were, were going in every country, and guess what? In Spain, when they came, the first the missionaries, they were Bond, the Bond, James Bond uh, family. They were having the, the, the tie and every set was where in the United States. And they were funny, considered to be very funny. But guess what? In a few years, many, they were dressing like them. So they were making the fashion. Soon these clothes, they became a fashion to the world. So everybody right now wears. So what Christian church, the missionaries they did, they brought this type of suit, more or less, I would say, to all the world. And right now, everybody dressed like this. Is this a bad thing? No, this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we put the traditions, as, as Samuel was mentioning, if you do come to this church and you do not have the right dress, because there are churches, including individuals I know personally, which they are throwing outside individuals from the <laughs> church because they are not having the, dress, the right dress of that church. And in that regard, we have to pay attention that when the tradition is about the word of God, that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Amen for that. Um, so I think we have gotten into the tradition part. So let's move on to experience, mm -hmm. uh, which we discussed on, in Monday's lesson. So I can get someone to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. I can do that. Second Corinthians um, 11, 11. One through three. verses 1 through 3, yes. All right. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly, je with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chast virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. All right. So what's dangerous about a spiritual life that depends solely on experience to establish what is good, faithful, and true? Before moving forward, I want to make a very clear point because we got tradition. The Sabbath school is very important and, and the main goal of the Sabbath school is to clarify the tradition, okay? The tradition because right now people, they see there are several individuals and scholars in the Seventh-day Adventists also that put tradition about the scripture. And let me be clear on that situation. In the second century, in the third century, practically the fathers of the church, they have uh, they have accepted, they have approved the, the 27 uh, books of the New Testament, uh, but they say that the fathers of the church are the authority. In other words, the fathers of the church, the individuals are the one, the tradition practically, is the one to acknowledge, to recognize the canon, and therefore the canon has been accepted by the fathers of the church, and they have the authority to do whatever they want. No. The fathers of the, the church, what, what, what they did was only to recognize what has been already in place. In other words, only on, already said, hey, these 27 books belong to the New Testament, and we're accepting them. So the fathers of the church do not have any authority over the Bible. Tradition has no authority over the Bible. Regarding the other point that you have mentioned about experience, 
Nowadays, there is a huge battle on experience because there are several scholars, including, for instance, Fredrik Schleimacher, uh, which say uh, this is the father of the uh, called the father of the liberal or I would say the modern critical critical liberal uh, theology, who says this: when you come to the Bible, the Bible is not true; it's not real; it's not the facts are not uh, real; are not uh, historical uh, proven. Therefore, we have to come before the Bible and have an experience with God. In other words, the, the book, the Bible, it's a channel between human beings and God. And this experience that we have to go through, but the facts in the Bible are not clear. So this is the main point that why we are discussing right now, the experience. And the question is, does the experience, your personal experience, validate the Bible, the truth? And your question was very good. Can our experience today, okay, say that this is the truth? Because if we go on that situation as postmodern, and I would say the generation X, X, Y, and Z, and is another one that is coming right now, they base all their uh, principles on their own experience. So when we place ourselves on, only on the experience of the Bible, it's an experience book, uh, that's a missing of the point. Because right now I feel something, tomorrow I will feel something else. And if everybody feels different, where we go? So the Bible is not an experience, okay? It, Jesus tries to have an experience with individuals to the facts, to the historical document, historical facts. When I speak about historical facts, I'm not speaking about the, how do you call it, uh, the archeological, we, we are not, I'm not going to, to go too much in detail. But the Bible is an archaeological book. It's, it's a historical book in the sense of uh, the events occur. This is what I'm trying to say. So it, we have to be very clear when we speak about the experience. The experience is good, but has to be based on the word of God. And the experience is not norm, is not principle to do a theology or to have a dogma or doctrine. Okay? So this is what is, is happening right now in the world. Because many churches, including the, the, the evangelical churches, they base their own understanding on the experience of the Bible rather than written. In other words, the facts. I would like to add that um, experience is not the arbitrator of truth. Okay. Um, you know, so we, we, we all, we can't get away from experience because we're, you know, that's just who we are. We can't live a life without experiences. But if we think about in the, in the end times in Revelation, um, Satan is going to use a lot of uh, deceptive methods to make you experience certain emotions. Like Revelation 13, 13 He's going to use a lot of sensory, and we need to realize that we need to stick with the truth, and we need to know what is more powerful, our experience or God. And I would beg to say that God is more powerful than our experiences. Thank you. And I think um, the, the issue was also, like the pastor kind of said it, you know, but if we don't have some 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 sort of external guy to let us know whether it's true or not then you know it's, it's very dangerous you know you know when this whole uh COVID-19 thing started you know some people thought it was a hoax you know and so the thing is well just because you haven't experienced it yet doesn't just because you know I'm in my house and with my family I haven't experienced it yet well it's not true and the next thing you know well people are dying well it's still a hoax so the thing is but people are getting hurt around you so it obviously it's, it's true right but some people would say no it's not and that's dangerous kind of thinking because then you become a danger to yourself and then the other people. It's the same thing spiritually. If we just dismiss what the Bible is saying and the principles that God is saying, then we become a danger, especially as Christians. We become a danger to the people around us and we become wow. a danger to ourselves because we are, we, are, uh, we are not allowing the light that God has given us through his word uh, to penetrate into our hearts and minds. Um, and so... It's, it's, a, it's a curious thing. And at the same time, though, we do as Christians need to have an experience with God. You know, this is not an intellectual pursuit. You know, this is not just I can answer five multiple choice questions about the Bible and then I'll be saved. I need to have a saving experience because if I don't have a saving experience, then when the tests do come and I am overwhelmed with the sensory 
uh, experiences of Satan, then I, I, I have to be able to lean on what God has shown me before in his word. So I think that's the balance, right? It can't be, we can't depend wholly on our experience we need to be depending upon God and God's word is supposed to be the, the, the standard of our experience. And as we experience these things, then we can withstand deception. But oftentimes many people, unfortunately, spiritually haven't had an experience with God. They come to church and may participate in a superficial type of way, but they haven't really experienced what it means to share the gospel, to be an instrument, to, to trust in God with their lives. And, and therefore um, when, like the parable of the sower or the seed, when tribulation really does come, then people, they fade away. So we, we need to have, go ahead. I was saying, I thank you for that because my next question was just that, um, what's the danger in a, life, a religious life that's solely based on belief that doesn't take any experiences into account? So thank you for answering that question. <laughs> um, and if anyone else had anything to say on that. I would like to share. Uh, because I'm preparing and tomorrow I have the, the uh, sermon on, on this topic. One of the quotations of Ren Juwat I want to share with all of you uh, is this. When we go to him, speaking about Jesus Christ, so he speaks about do not rely on your feelings, okay? When we go to him, to Jesus, for wisdom or grace, we are not to look to ourselves to see if he has given us a special feeling as an assurance that he has fulfilled his word. Feeling is not a criterion. And she says, great evils have been resolved when Christians have followed feeling. Satan can give feelings and impression, and those who take this as their guide will surely be led astray. How do I know that Jesus hears my prayers? She asked. I know it is by his promise. In other words, what he said in the Bible. He says he will hear the needy when they try, when they cry unto him. And I believe his word. You see, the criterion has to be the word of God. He mm -hmm. has not said to see, uh, to, to, uh, to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. So what we try to say is that feelings, they have to be in a, in a, in a certain place. And, and the question is, in the Christianity right now has been a discussion, a huge discussion about tradition and feelings. And let me be another, let me have another thought here. <clears throat> when, when it's important, the tradition, oh yes, it's very important tradition, and hear me what I'm trying to say. Seventh-day Adventist also has a tradition, we are a community. We cannot rely on the feelings of each individual. We are coming together, and we discuss, and we recognize what is already in the Bible. So the community, the Seventh-day Adventist, we recognize the doctrines of the Bible. And we recognize those doctrines of the Bible and every time from time to time, because we are a movement, okay? We say that this is the 28 or 29 or 30 doctrinal fundamental beliefs, you see? So the tradition plays an important role, but the tradition all the time is submitted to the Bible and the tradition, the community of Seventh-day Adventists, it's only recognizing what the Bible says, it's in the Bible. So the authority does not stay in the community, stays in the word of God. So you see what I'm trying to say? So mm -hmm. then the uh, feelings, okay, the feelings, the community, when the feelings of the community comes together and they have the community based on the word of God, they discover the word of God because God is manifesting himself to the Holy Spirit, to the community, revealing the truth, okay, they are coming and they see in the Bible, and then all together they recognize what the Bible says. So the first authority of the Seventh-day Adventists and my authority, and I wanted to be like this, I'm choosing this to believe that God has a written word, that the authority stays in the word, and the community, Seventh-day Adventists, recognize only what has been uh, uh, written. Okay, so this is a, this is a huge tension in in, in, the, in theology also in, in the secular world because many people they place themselves they place their feelings above the Bible. Does anyone else want to jump in on that before we move on to the culture? I mean, I, I think that um, you know just to reiterate, I think about it as a relationship. You know, uh, you may find somebody you really like them a lot. Um, 
and then you start talking to them, then you realize that your values are are different, you know, drastically different. How to raise kids, money, all these other things. And many people have rushed headlong based on their feelings, and then they have a situation where, you know, the relationship or the marriage is not the way that they wanted it to be because they were ignoring those principles for feeling. And then you got the flip side where some people, um, well, everything looks good on paper. We're both Seventh Day Adventists. We both go to church. We both return tithe. And they ignore the fact that, well, but something's missing. You know, I don't really have that passion for that person. And we're told in the uh, spirit of prophecy to marry somebody you don't love is sin. So the thing is, we, so the, so you got to have both, right? You got to have both, but it should be like uh, Pastor Stoyan says, it needs to be when you, when, when you look at your relationship with Christ it has to be that we're following what God's word says, but then an accompanying experience should, should happen with that. So uh, the relationship, I think kind of, uh, clarifies it in my mind because that's kind of an obvious example you see oftentimes unfortunately is that feelings will guide people into relationships and make decisions but there's not not based on principles or the flip side there's no love there's no real feeling and there's a loveless marriage and that's a travesty as well i agree you know i think the the bible should kind of be like a sandwich i, I, I don't know where i got sandwich from <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be hungry, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I guess it kind of makes sense. The, it should be the the thing that we not only that we stand on, but the thing that covers us. So everything in between our feelings, our traditions, should be in line with the Bible. Right. Um, and because uh, there's not because you should have feelings, you know. Uh, the there's nothing you know like like a like a. Uh, Samuel was saying, "There's no, uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with feelings. You're supposed to have these feelings. These feelings are, feelings are a God-given thing, and uh, He wants you to feel good about your relationship with Him. Um, this, this, this being as part of the bride of Christ, uh, you should love the one whom you're espoused to. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and but you know, just the way love is a fleeting, so is lust." and it's fleeting it's a fleeting feeling uh so uh so you're 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 you don't want to jump into something based on the fact that it just makes you feel good uh you don't want to stick to a tradition just because it makes you feel good um if if it's if it's not wholly uh bible based then it's just you can you can it can go <laughs> it, can, it can go um yeah that's all i got a lot of our feelings stem from our hearts and it all depends on what's in your heart um because i was looking at the scripture second corinthians 11 verse 3 where it says that the serpent beguiled eve you know eve had already strayed away from her husband's side and looking at that tree and what was in her heart, she let her feelings for that draw her away. So I think as our heart changes by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, our feelings change also. And um, it becomes more in line with, with scripture. Um, I think, you know, God will put a peace and a joy in our heart that will temper the way we feel, temper the things we experience. But we have to be aware, as Samuel said, and the pastor, that we don't let situations give us a fall, in, false impression, false feelings, because Satan will try his best to discourage in certain situations he will try his best to encourage in certain situations. So we have to always, when we have those feelings, look at them and say, is this in line with God's promises? Is this in line with God's word? And I think that's happening a lot now. You know, we, we're getting caught up with feelings and we have to be careful we are not swept away because when the feelings, feelings overwhelm, the only thing we could hold on to are the promises of God. Amen. Um, so let's uh, let's stray away from the experience and move on to culture, which we discussed in Tuesday's lesson. 
if I can get someone to read 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. That's 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. I'll do it. I'll do that. Um, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So what in this, in this text, what does it mean that we should not love the things of this world? And how can we live in the world but not have a worldly mindset? Hmm. Um, the, the, the world as, as, it, as, it kind of, as, it, as I kind of read it through the text is, is, is absent. I want, yeah, let's, let's, I'll, I'll go with what I'm saying. <laughs> the world is absent of, of, of God um, and does the things that it can to fill that hole uh, with whatever it can, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, to, 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 to kind of get that feeling of, uh, of, of God, whether it's just a, that God is all around you or I am God or whatever the world wants it to be so that it doesn't have to deal with the fact that it doesn't have God. Um, Cause there are many good things in the world. Uh, you know, there's good people out there that are in the world, but the, the, the lack of God in the world is the thing that uh, uh, we don't want to, fall in love with i guess um because uh when you when you start to look too much at the world as uh you start to look too much at the world you you it 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 kind of creates a substitute for the things of god because that's that's what the world's goal kind of is is to fill a fill a hole that lacks god in it mm. um but when you when you live in the world and you have God in you. It's 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 not. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't say it was too. It would be too hard to live in the world and not be of it. Just because uh, if you if when you when you you have to stand on the Bible first of all and the Word of God. Um, because without that, you're just gonna end up in the world again. Uh, but the uh, the, the the Word of God, the 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 relationship with Jesus. Uh, these key things are uh, are what can take you out of the world because this is it's a spiritual experience, um, and uh, it and Jesus has the power to drag you out of the world, and then you will see the world because like you know you, you I bet there's people on this call now that used to enjoy worldly music and uh, you know you might walk into like a Walmart or something nowadays. Uh, if you can get it in Walmart nowadays, and uh, and you hear the music playing across the radio, it's like man, it's like this is what they're playing in public. But if it was you know five years ago, ten years ago, you'd be bobbing your head and snapping your fingers, and you'd know all the words already. Um, so it's uh, it's it, and so you hear this, and and then you see these other people walking around Walmart. They're doing that very same thing, uh, and one of the one of the good parts about the fact that you can't be born a Christian is that you remember your past experience. Uh, so you know that they are someplace that you were um, and whatever they might be going through, uh, Jesus can, can pull them out of that too. Um, so you, you look at the world with, with the, the eyes of a person who has been in the world uh, because nobody's, like I said, nobody's born a Christian. So we were all kind of part of the world at some point before we made the decision to be with Christ. And, uh, you look at the world with those eyes of knowledge and then the, and then the knowledge of other people 
and shared experiences, you know, that have happened in the Bible and people that you know, and uh, you don't uh, condemn the world for who they are and what they've done, but you try to save them um, because uh, because you want them to come to Christ too, which which kind of builds. Man, I am talking a lot. <laughs> which kind of builds on the, <laughs> on the things of tradition. Uh, Cause a lot of times, you know, these people coming fresh out of the world will not know these traditions will, and, and sometimes will not, you know, they're, they're coming fresh out of the world. They don't properly know the world, the word of God, but it's, it's a learning experience, it's a building experience. And we meet them where they are and try to get them to where their relationship with Christ has more control over them than the world uh, does and the, the, uh, the things that it has to offer. Um, because you're not, you don't wanna pull them out of the world and say, okay, now you have to do this, now you have to do that, now you have to do the other thing. Um, because that, that's legalism that's, and it's unnecessary. If they don't have the relationship with Christ, if they don't know who Jesus is, then all that's just gonna, do the things that we were talking about before is create feelings in them you know which which will be temporary and without that relationship there's no love and then there's no there's no god in it. so uh and then they'll just end up falling right back into the world again uh yeah so i'm gonna stop talking about it. <laughs> that was really good though <laughs> <laughs> too, it's too many words <laughs> it's a good explanation does anyone else have um Anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, it, it seems like if you compare the last part where it says, you know, the world is passing away and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And I think the temptation for all of us being in the world is to get so caught up on this life that we don't think about the life to come. And it becomes, instead of thy will, it becomes my will. You know, many people work really hard. They try to get, you know, the biggest house, the biggest cars so they can do what they want. And I think that's what it comes down to. People just want to do what they want. I don't want God telling me what I have to do, my obligation to him. When Jesus was talking about in the days of Noah, there's a lot of things that we participate in. Most of us here on this call, to my knowledge, have been married or married. That's not a bad thing. Eating is not a bad thing. Drinking is not a bad thing. Those aren't, those aren't bad things in and of themselves when they're put, when they're subservient to the Lord's will. But when all your life is consumed with uh, fulfilling your desires, fulfilling your pleasures, and you don't think about what God wants, uh, then we're we're living we're living of the world, right? Because it has no it, it, it it's like what Christ wants uh, is not important. It's, I don't care about it, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And many people do not come to Christ because. They realize that when you surrender to God, you're surrendering your desires, you're surrendering your will. And that's the struggle we all have, you know, even in, even in the things that aren't so bad, uh, I think that's why it's so subtle um, that sometimes doing God's will um, will, will cause you to step away from things that maybe aren't bad in and of themselves but you don't want to go to the extreme i don't think there's nothing wrong with me having a job right and preparing providing for my family but if i'm so consumed with cl climbing the corporate ladder or climbing whatever ladder that i neglect the spiritual uh, role of being spiritual leader my family nurturing my family going to church all these other things so i can accumulate whatever i need to accumulate or get these titles and there's a problem there i think I, I think it's interesting that um, we can't choose the culture we're born into. Right. And, and that affects our worldview and everything. However, we can choose to be willing to leave that culture behind as we develop a stronger relationship with God. So a lot of times we're kind of comfortable in the culture that we're in. And, and I think that's what these guys have been describing. But we have to realize that sometimes our culture separates us from God and Christ expects his people to be willing to walk away from the culture. And I'm reminded of Ruth, um, the story of Ruth in Ruth 1.16, when she walked away from her culture and, and went, um, you know, um, 
and became an Israelite and it changed her life from then on out. But um, that's just an example in the Bible of, of that happening. She left her culture and started anew with Christ. I, I like um, 2 Timothy um, chapter 3. Where it, where it talks about in the last days, perilous times will come and men will be lovers of their own self, covetous, bolsters, all these different things. But it comes down to the end and says that um, they, are, they love all these things more than they love God. And what it brings to me is that they do love God, but they love all these things before God. God is way down on the um, so that tells me I could be in the world, I could be part of the world, but God must always come first in the things that I do and the things that I seek after. I must, I can accumulate things like Samuel said, but they, they must be tempered by my love of God. Um, I heard, um, a, a Cameron for C.S. Lewis or Mark Twain says, that we have to wear this world loosely like a cloak. We can't afford to be wrapped up in it. We have to wear it loosely, remembering that this whole world is fodder for fire. And we, we, we build with our eyes set on heaven and eternity. And, and, and that um, the Bible, the Bible, no matter how the world changes around us, the Bible is supposed to be a precious gem. The settings may change, but the gem must always be there, bright and shining forth, no matter what setting it's placed in. Amen. And I think that um, as we talk about the culture and being of the, in, the, in the world, but not of the world, one thing that Samuel mentioned is that well, actually, both Samuel and Marlon mentioned that you can't be born a Christian. So you see these things and you have to kind of understand for yourself, which leads us to Wednesday's lesson of reason. Um, so if we could read, uh, one person read Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and another person to read Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. So you can see what God has equipped us it comes to reason. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Isaiah 1 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. So what is the danger in using human reason without the knowledge of God? Um, in using human reason, we're using our finite mind to try to understand an infinite God. And we'll always fall short. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're limited. I think Heather said, hit it right on the head. We're limited. So the thing is, you know, your reasoning is only as good as all the information you have in, have in front of you, right? Um, we all know that it's your brain that controls how you, how you move. But some people may think, well, if I cut off, it's the leg, right? That's not, that's, that's not the truth. It's the, it's the leg. But if you don't understand how the brain works and all those other things, then your reasoning may be sound, right? But you still may have the wrong conclusion. I think, too, if we think of it as God's promises and his power um, are often confused or substituted with our own human power and ability, and we need to separate that God is more powerful than us. We need to remember that and not rely on our own reasoning, but be given over to God. Like First Timothy, which you were reading, all scripture is given for, from, from God by inspiration for instruction and, um, you know, it's profitable for uh, correction. We need to remember that. 
I want to share also a few thoughts uh, going a little bit back to the culture and also to the reason coming back. Um, uh, we judge the Bible uh, to our culture or to the culture of this time, we are making a big uh, mistake. Let me share with you what I'm trying to say. People today, today they try to, um, to impose or to say what the Bible said in their time with the knowledge of what right now they experience. They, for instance, in the Old Testament, you cannot see a God of the Old Testament killing, giving orders to kill. So today we see our culture sees uh, in, in a way the Bible. We cannot judge the Bible according to what we experience for our culture is. We have to go back to understand what was the time and what was God going to do in that time. Uh, so then we have to cut, you have to judge the Bible with the culture of the Bible. Um, and now we today speaking about the culture, um, we the Bible is very clear that we have an identity. Our culture is a totally different culture than the culture we live today. In other words, even though we are in the world, we are not of this world. We have a different culture. In other words, we do not have to be led astray because we feel or because the clothes are changing or things are changing, the fashion is changing and everything. So therefore, let us be as this culture is. Christian culture is the Christian Bible culture, which that's a huge difference. In other words, Christians, we got a seed in our heart, a seed of truth and knowledge and love. And this has to be contaminating the others. We should not be let ourselves be contaminated by this culture. So the culture of the Bible is a totally different culture than the culture we live today. So in every situation, in no matter what time we live, no matter what culture we live, we have to implement the culture of the Bible in every setting. And also, as I was saying, we should not take the culture of today to impose on the Bible how the Bible should be then today in the sense of saying hey right now that god is not the god of the old testament not my god right now i'm going on, the, on in the new testament you have to take understanding on oh, second point a reason you see many people today they base they base their own religion on reason on reason europe in special i'm coming from europe i'm, I'm a romanian europe in special gives a lot of credit to reason the the uh, reason uh, period of time has started and when all of this, uh, the reason is playing an important role. So humanism started with reason. In other words, when we define God, when we create God, as, as they say, we are creating God. The reason has to be here. So we are the ones to create God. When you put yourself about that, be careful. Because the second step that you are taking is to fall down and to crash. And we see, for instance, the first world war, the second world war, communism, um, uh, China, communism has killed millions and millions and millions. Cuba, every time when we see a culture without God, we see criminality, we see a huge, huge atrocity happening. So the culture of the Bible has to impose, has to speak about principles, clear principles, and we cannot base our religion only on a reason. Reason plus faith has to be our life and our principles. Why? Because if today I cannot explain it, I have to accept it because God said it, because tomorrow God will explain me. But today I don't have the knowledge. But if you say, if it's not there, and I cannot be proven by the history or by the science. I don't believe it. Mm. It's dangerous because science every single day changes. The Bible doesn't change. So we have a shallow ground. We have a sandy ground. If we base our, all our principles on the culture, on, on reason. And you know, I don't want to talk about uh, ethics at this moment, but every single ethic is taking his root from outside. When you take the, the ethic from your inside, from the deep, from your own culture, you, it, sooner or later you destroy it. It's, it's created, look on communism. The ethics of the communists, for instance, was everybody is the same, but they were missing a part, many other things. 
I'm not going to follow more on that. What I'm trying to say, it must take me another time. But the most important is that reason plus faith. Okay, God is giving us plenty of reasons to believe in the Bible. But there are some portions that we don't understand today, but tomorrow with God's grace and by His grace, He will explain it. So let's believe in it. We have to remember that our reason is affected by sin. Correct. So um, we need to bring our reason under the reign of Christ in order to reason correctly. Beautiful. And I think what the pastor said is that, you know, at the end of that is there's a lot of things that we will never understand. Correct. They're in the Bible. We, we won't understand it. Not in this life. Tomorrow we may understand as God explains things to us. And those things can be found in the Bible, which is part of our Thursday's lesson, is looking at the Bible, which is the foundation for it all. Um, if I can get someone to read John chapter 7, verse 38. John chapter 7, verse 38. All right. Go ahead. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Amen. So it mentions the scripture in this, in this verse, and we have Bibles all around us. So we have our physical Bibles. We have Bibles on our phone. We have Bibles on our computer. We have them in different languages. We have multiple versions. Um, how does this, do we use the Bible, although we have access to it, how do we use it? to guide us in our daily lives. Mm. I think we have to root ourselves with the truth of the Bible. We have to, to, to grow in, you know, put down a foundation and really root ourselves in. And, and I think too, if we're studying the Bible and an indicator would be, if we're not bearing fruit from what we're learning in the Bible, then we're not studying it with the right heart, and we need to, to be aware that we need uh, the help of the Holy Spirit to help us there. And just as a follow-up question on that, um, as you're thinking about that, what are some of the consequences that could happen when we don't accept the Bible as a standard by which we test all of the teachings and even our own spiritual experience that we were talking about earlier? Oh. Well, that one, that, well, that one is nice and easy because you'll get led astray right away. <laughs> you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna, you don't even wanna. It's gone. Because I'll, 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 uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to uh, some an example. Like I ran into a, I didn't run into. I had a class once with a guy, um, who, uh, who was a who believed in the Bible, but didn't. I, I, didn't, I didn't understand how he put it. <laughs> he, he believed in the Bible as that the whole Bible was true. These are, this, is, this is his words, but that creation wasn't true and that a lot of the Bible was written by the Jews to make themselves sound good. But it was still inspired by God and it, it didn't make sense. <laughs> put it that way. It didn't make sense. Like these and, yeah and and then when then when you when you when you when you start doing stuff like that um which is not looking at the which is looking at the bible i guess through the lens of of a of a i guess a human eye I, do i want to say that cuz you don't you don't look at the bible like it, it was written by by a man writing a book you look at the bible like it is a book dictated by god and then written by a man kind of you know um like it, it of course it every every person that's why you know matthew mark and luke are all different it was because they they wrote it their way um but uh it's all still god's words nothing got into the bible without it being um inspired by god um so uh so when you when you don't take that as a as a fact um with the thing when you when you when you're reading the bible then you're gonna think that anything that happens um that 
kind of fits or feels good is is just going to start to pull you away um here's another example i was talking to another person um the other i don't know maybe this week i don't know sometime and we were talking about samuel uh not 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 you samuel but oh okay i was about to say (laughs) i don't owe you any money (laughs) (laughs) we were we were we were were discussing uh samuel and, and saul and um they were saying how well yeah it, it how how it must have been samuel that um that that came back because they made a prophecy that wasn't that that came true and they mentioned god a couple of times i was like that's that's not the thing that qualifies whether or not this is mm-hmm. this is correct you know god says before that many times uh don't go see witches don't mess with people that are uh, that are bringing out uh, spirits, um, and that the the dead um, go to dust. That's all that's been established already. If you come to something that goes uh, left from that, that's not of God. Um, and then, and then her mind got blown, and the conversation had to end. But uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, you if you when you stand, if you if you're not standing on the word of God. Anything that looks good enough to you, to you that seems to be God, is going to pull you away from what is actually God. I think that answered one of your questions. <laughs> I don't remember anymore. Well, yeah, and I, and, and I think what happens, it kind of goes back to what we talked about before in terms of, um, you know, one thing about the Adventist church, which is very important, is that not only are we preaching the three angels' message, the everlasting gospel, we're also preaching truth. And we can't understate that because I remember hearing this a long time ago, but it makes sense. It's like, we've been given a message to prepare people for the second coming of Christ. Do I believe that you need to be a Seventh-day Adventist to be saved? No, that's not what I'm trying to say. But I will say this, that there are truths that will, that we are preaching that when the deceptions come, when the Sunday law comes, when all these things come, when all, when all the deceptions of Satan come that hold these truths, in your heart and mind that you'll be swept away. I don't believe God raised us up for just to be trivial, but to prepare people for his second coming. And so when we start going away from God's word, then we set ourselves on a way in which we could be deceived. Mm-hmm. I think that's something we have to remember is like, we could, we could be deceived because like a brother Marlon brings out a good point. You know, well, if you don't know about the state of the dead, what are you going to do when it's your uh, grandmother telling you, Hey, uh, you need to go with this movement. What are you going to do? You know, you'll just go along with it because it feels right. All your senses, everything prepared. And we know that uh, Paul talks about how Satan will become an angel of light, right? And so he will deceive people. And especially what those people that did not have a love for the truth, a knowledge and love for the truth. And so uh, it's very important that um, we view God's word in that way because uh, if we don't, then I think we can be deceived. And even in all, even in our lives today, I mean, I'm pretty sure as Christians, all of us have uh, been in situations where, for us, God has given us insight. And you're talking to a person, trying to give us give them insight, and they're looking like you, like you're crazy. And the next thing you know, they didn't listen, and then they, then all these things that happened uh, that you said were going to happen happens. And it's like you'd be surprised how much, as Christians, we don't realize how much insight He gives us. And that people don't have this insight. Um, and because of the insight he gives us, we're able to live lives that bring glory to him. And even our lives are not just, you know, God has given us life, but abundant life. And I think mm-hmm. that we should be mindful of, uh, we have a responsibility of sharing these things with other people because, you know, we should be a blessing to other people. And if we are not living in the light, then we, we, we can't share what we don't have. Yeah. And as you say that, Samuel, about um, sharing with others and witnessing to others, how can we take the experience, the culture, the tradition, the reasoning, and the Bible all together and put them into one package when we're witnessing to others and as we're sharing about Christ's love and what's to come, even with the prophecies, and, and why we should believe the Bible, why we should study the Bible? Um, how do we package all of those things together? as part of that. I love this quote from the Sabbath school lesson on page 35, because it says the Bible is a higher authority 
than our tradition, our experience, our reason, and our culture. Mm -hmm. And it says the Bible alone is the norm by which everything else needs to be tested. I think that kind of summed up the lesson. Yeah. And I, I, you know, there's like I was, you know, I'm sure there's uh, a person on this call who's had an experience uh, with uh, a different culture and trying to preach to them where uh, they, they really couldn't handle the, the way the, the regular Western things happening. Wink, wink, the pastor on the Amazon. But um, the, uh, <laughs> like I was, and you know, but there, but these, but these, there are things like uh that you don't have to stand on traditionally but uh there are things that you need to show them uh factually traditionally from the bible that uh because this is god it will get through to them the way it needs to um and that's you know you have if you have a prayerful heart and you remember that you're doing this for god um and so that these people can can know the the true god um it it will 100 percent reach them um if you keep uh god in your heart the bible as your first authority and um uh you're able you're able to get through any of the the things that the world has that that uh might kind of coming in contrast with what someone is trying to do And as we close the Sabbath school lesson, are there any of the thoughts that kind of wrap this all together? Yeah, I think that as a Christians, kind of stepping, on, kind of piggyback on what Marlon says, we have to. I think we present we present God's word first, but I do think that it's important that we are mindful of the culture that we are in. You know, in 1950 or 1940s, Pastor can correct me. Probably, it's probably safe to say that most of us had a Christian background, and we can assume that if I were to present the Bible from a uh, logical well this is why i believe in the state of the dead or what have you from a biblical point of view maybe it's just taken or it's accepted but now we're in a in an age where experience is important so then guess what my experience in the bible may be highlighted versus just a proof text that doesn't mean that i don't study god's word that doesn't mean that i don't care about tradition but the way in which you present things we have to assume that we can't we we can't do things the way we used to do i mean even the fact that we're that we're recording this sabbath school lesson or we're going to be streaming services you know yeah maybe you know 80 years ago or you know because we didn't have technology it was okay just to expect everybody to come and be there but that we're not living in in this day and age people i mean many of us i have amazon prime we don't watch things synchronously we look at video on demand many of us right and we don't even think about it so why does god word why is god's word always have to be live why can't it be there for people to view when they want you know so it's just these things we have to be mindful of in reaching people all right any final thoughts okay well thank you all for joining us for sabbath school and thank you for joining us through facebook and youtube as well um, we appreciate you being here take your time out on the sabbath to go through the lesson with us if you have any questions comments please leave them in our comments below on Facebook and we will try to get back to all the comments and respond to everyone. Uh, but we will close out with prayer from Zach. We can close this out in prayer. And I think, Zach, I think you may be back. muted. I apologize for that. All right. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing all of us here safely to study your word. Um, Lord, I pray that each of us can walk away learning something new, and please help us as we go through your holy Sabbath day. Please help us as we continue to study scriptures. Please help us to be in the world, but not of the world. Help, help us, excuse me, to find the most efficient ways to reach people and to do your work. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And join us next week at 930 as we study by scripture alone, sola scriptura.
And please stay tuned to our channel. We will have um, announcements and a sermon from Pastor Soyan. So have a wonderful Sabbath. Wonderful Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.